Hi, everyone. Uh, my name's David Seddon. Um, I'm a Python developer at Octopus Energy, which is a renewable energy company. I'm also the maintainer of Import Linter and Impulse. And I'm going to talk to you today about how to write readable tests. So code readability in general is really important. Who would agree with me? Yes, lots of you. Um, but what's prompted me to talk today about test readability in, in particular? Well, over the years, I've worked on different code bases with different teams, and I've noticed a bit of a tendency. It's that our tests tend to be less readable than our production code. So you might be working with the code in your production system, and it's relatively easy to work with and understand, but then you head over to the tests, and you sigh, and are confronted with a bit of a mess, and there are long functions with lots and lots of code that you can't really understand, and you end up scratching your head and feeling sorry for yourself. Who can relate to this? Some of you. Great. Um, so I think this is a shame, uh, because tests that are not readable are shackled into being so much less than a nice readable test. There are advantages that readable tests have, which difficult to understand, understand tests don't have. So firstly, they can help clarify scope. Um, I don't know if you've ever been in a, in a situation where you've been given a feature to develop, but you're not quite sure what you're actually meant to do. You sort of maybe know vaguely, but you, know, you don't specifically know at the beginning what you're meant to do. Has anyone ever been in this position? Yes, me, lots. Uh, so what you can do if you're in this position is instead of just trying to thrash around writing code, uh, write a test um, that explains what you're trying to achieve. And you might even want to do that with someone else. Or you could write the test and then get someone to review it before you start writing any code. So they, they can be used to clarify the scope before you write any production code. Secondly, if that code then makes it into production, your test becomes living documentation. So you can go to that test, and it will tell you how your system's behaving. Now, you're not going to do that with a test that is difficult to read. You're going to look somewhere else. And finally, a readable test can facilitate the change of your system. So if you've got a bit of your system that you need to change how it works, and it's already covered with some nice readable tests, then you can go to those tests and change them so they express how the system should now behave, watch them fail, and then write the code that causes them to pass. Classic test-driven development. So there's lots of value that readability brings if you make your test readable. And with that in mind, I'm going to give you six principles for readable tests. This is going to be quite quick fire. It's a bit of a grab bag. It's not very comprehensive. If you miss bits, don't worry. There's a link to these slides at the end. Ready. Go. So pr principle number one is profit from the works of others. Uh, I simply mean by this uh, that there are tools already out there that can help make your tests more readable. Who uses PyTest? Loads of people. It's great. It has loads of features, uh, and I'd say a lot of the features are around reducing test code boilerplate, making them easier to read. So here is an example. On the, on the right-hand side, was that right? Left-hand side. On the left-hand side, uh, you have um, a classic Python unit test from the built-in library. Um, and we have to subclass unit test dot test case. And then we're making this funny camel case assert equal. On the right-hand side, it's so much simpler and easier to read. This will be run OK with PyTest. And it's just a simple function. And then at the bottom there, you have a nice plain old Python assertion much more readable. Shout outs for a couple of other libraries you might want for readability. Web test is great for interacting with web applications. That gives you a nice Python API for filling out forms and making HTTP requests and clicking buttons and things. Um, and Factory is really good if you've got complex object models like from an ORM where you want to put together um, test data. So have a look at those. The next principle, so that's the first principle, profit from the work of others. The next principle is put naming to work. So naming is really important in readability. Um, here are a couple of test-related readability tips. The first one 
is in naming your functions. Now, because nothing ever calls a test function, it's tempting just to sort of write anything, really. Um, on the left, we have test number available. It's kind of a bit vague. What does it really mean? You, could, you can think of your test functions as sort of comments and be quite verbose and even write them as sentences. So on the right, we have test add to cart reduces number available. It's just doing more work with the same number of lines. So uh, that's the first thing. Be specific in your test names. Secondly, um, if we look on the right, here we are instantiating three dates. Date one, date two, and date three. It doesn't say anything at all. How are we meant to understand these? This is particularly a problem in tests because you're creating test data, and it's not necessarily obvious what the intent of your test data is. Are these just three random dates? Is there some relationship with them? Is it significant that the first date is the first date of the year? We just don't know. On the right, simply by giving more specific names, we're communicating the intent of these uh, dates. So some date, that implies, well, it's just some date, any date, really. Then earlier date, it implies that it's before some date. And later date implies it's afterwards. There's, it's doing a lot more work for the same code. That's principle number two. Principle number three is show only what matters. I think this is one of the most important principles because I think one of the main problems with tests is when you look at uh, test code, you can't see the wood for the trees. There's so much detail in there and you don't know what's important. So um, a really good way of helping with this is just to hide the unimportant in private functions or methods. So on the left, don't worry about reading this, it's a test, it's not even that bad, but there's just quite a lot of things going on. On the right, it's the same test, but I've just pulled things down into three private functions. So now, if we read through it, cart equals create full cart. Complete order on the cart, assert cart is empty. I mean, it's just obvious what it's doing, much more obvious than the other way. We don't have all these details of price per unit and quantity that are just not relevant. Well, you can go too far. So if we look again on the left, uh, we're creating a full cart, then we're applying a voucher to the cart, and we're asserting that cart total is £11.63. Where did that come from, that number? We've hidden too much information. So what you want to do is pull up just the right amount of information. So on the right, cart equals create full cart, total £11.99. Now, notice we're not, like this cart probably contains several items, or it could do. But we don't care about the items, but we do care about the total. So we're um, exposing just the total with that private function to signify our intent. Then we're applying a voucher with a specific discount percentage of three. And then we're asserting that the cart total is 11.63. This is starting to get a bit more clear about what's important in the tests. However, there is a bit of a problem with this. 11.99, 3, 11.63 how are they related? We can make some guesses, but it's guesswork. So my next tip is, with mathematical stuff, show you're working. So this is the same test, it's just got a comment in, and I'm just explaining where the numbers are coming from. And I've done it so that it breaks it down absolutely clearly, uh, including the rounding approaches, so that you could literally get a calculator and you could work your way through the whole test and arrive at the final number. It's unambiguous calculation. Another tip for show only what matters is to use a simplified data model. So imagine you've got a model for an order um, which contains several lines of a product, and each one has a quantity. So this is a bit like a shopping cart kind of thing. Um, so this might be stored in a relational database, say as Django or SQL Alchemy models. But for the purposes of our test, all we really care about is the order total and the lines and the quantity on the lines. So on the left-hand side, this is the classic way you might assert that you've got the order in the right shape. So you'll make lots of different assertions. Maybe you'll like check that there's the right number of lines, and then you'll check each line in turn, different attributes on each line. I don't like this very much. I feel it's difficult to read. 
Now, on the right, this is how I'd like to be able to do it. It couldn't be more readable than this. It just expresses exactly what you want the order to be. So we're making an assertion about a simpler data structure. But how could we do this in practice? And it actually turns out it's very easy in Python. And I do this all the time. So what you do is you get your actual result, and then you transform it into the simplified model. And then you compare that against your expected result, which is in the form of the simplified model. So if we look at this in code, on the left, we might have a little private function which transforms your Django or SQL Alchemy model into the result that's in that more simplified model. And then you just assert it. And you can do this really easily with Python data classes, which will assert that they're equal if all the values on them are equal. Um, so uh, very little code. That's all the code that's needed on the right for defining the data classes. Transformation, I don't have time to show you, but it's not difficult. So that's the um, show only what matters principle. The next principle is don't repeat yourself. This is probably the most controversial of the principles. Who here thinks that you should repeat yourself in test? <laughs> yes, I thought some people would disagree with me. So my argument is that often this can lead people astray a bit. So I think there are two reasons for the don't repeat yourself principle. The first reason is that your code should have a single source of truth. So you don't want to have two places in your business logic where it's like doing two different things. And that's really, really important, but it can sometimes impair readability because you're having to create abstractions to make it just in one place. But there is another reason for don't repeat yourself. And that is maintainability and readability. I think this is a big reason why you shouldn't repeat yourself. You don't want to have lots of copied and pasted code. And while the first one doesn't apply to tests, the second one absolutely does. So you shouldn't avoid don't repeat yourself just because you're with using tests. In fact, you should usually try not to repeat yourself, um, but only for reasons of maintainability and readability, not for any other reason. So with that convincing argument in place. Uh, the, here are some tips for avoiding repeating yourself. Firstly, uh, private functions and methods. If you've got some of those which are hiding information, you can also call them from multiple tests. Secondly, subclassing tests. You can use object orientation principles to help make your code more dry. So PyTest allows you to create abstract test classes all you need is a class which doesn't begin with the word test, and then it won't run the test on it. So here we have a base class with some test methods, and then we're subclassing it with a couple of other tests with some other test methods. And PyTest will run both of these concrete test classes with the inherited test classes as well. So you can do all sorts of nice things with this pattern. PyTest parameterization is another tip for writing, uh, uh, for avoiding repeating yourself. So um, this allows you to have a single function, and then you decorate it with different inputs, and then it will run it multiple times for each set of inputs. That's don't repeat yourself. The next principle, principle five, is arrange, act, assert. You may know this as given, when, then, um, and uh, it basically talks about structuring your test in three blocks. So first of all, you have the arrange block, where you uh, assemble the test data ready to run the test. Then you have the act, where you actually run the code that's under test. And finally, you set things to check that it did what you expected it to do. So uh, if we look at this example test, um, then uh, I'm just going to read it out. Account equals create account. Product equals create product, and we're creating 10 products, each of which cost one pound each. And then what we're going to do is we're going to add three of these products to the accounts cart. Now we're checking that there are only seven products left. And then we're getting the accounts cart, and we're checking that the cart has a total price of three pounds, three times one pound. So it's not that difficult to read, but there's something a bit funny about this test. And the reason is, is it's not following that AAA pattern. Um, in fact, it's got two asserts. And 
we could more usefully break this apart into two tests. And then what we can do is we can move the arrange code and the at code and the assert code into three separate blocks. If you look at the um, previous uh, code here, it's not that clear what we're actually testing. Is the create account, is that part of the code under test? How about create product? How about get cart? What, what are we focused on here? So um, by breaking it apart, it becomes much, much clearer that we're testing the add to cart function. I would say that you can relax this rule somewhat in certain cases. For example, if you want some big end-to-end -end tests that are testing loads of things and you don't care too much about getting signal on specific bugs, you might want to have some arrangement and then act as a, act as a, uh, that's just my opinion. You don't always have to do it. We're at our final principle, aim high. So I think this is the most important principle. And simply, it's just that I don't think maybe we try hard enough. I think maybe we treat test as a second class citizen in our code. And so my first tip is to treat test like a first class citizen, uh, which means doing the things that we already do with our production code. So that means properly peer reviewing our tests thoroughly and refactoring our tests so that we can keep improving them. And I think through things like this, we can raise the standard. So it's about holding ourselves to a higher standard and not just letting it slide. I'm, I don't know if you guys, when you, sorry, I'm not going to use the word guys, uh, you people, sorry. Um, uh, I don't know if you read uh, code when you do a pull request, you might read the test at the end. Have you noticed how GitHub puts it at the bottom of the pull request? Anyone notice that? Maybe people whose packages begin before T in the alphabet, I'm guessing. <laughs> um, so a, a little tip is to review tests first. You can go through and look for the tests and read them first. And it's somehow emotionally easier, for me at least, to read that and um, sort of review it before I actually dig into the details of how it's implemented. And you can actually hack your colleagues by splitting your pull requests up into separate commits and putting your failing tests at the top of your commits. So you're forcing them to read those things first, and uh, hopefully they'll give better quality reviews and treat your test as first-class citizens. So that's the final tip. One last time for these six principles. First, profit from the work of others. Put naming to work. Show only what matters. Don't repeat yourself. Arrange, act, assert, and finally, aim high. Thank you. Thank you, David. And we've got some time for questions. Anyone has Comments are also OK. Oh, yes. <laughs> you don't have to pretend it's a question. <laughs> I'm sorry if I'm displaying my ignorance, but I see you're using underscores somewhere and describing numbers. Oh, yes. Um, OK, yes. So um, this is a, a little readability tip. You can put underscores in integers in Python, and it doesn't affect their meaning. It just ignores them. So if you're, for example, uh, denoting pence with an integer, you can put the underscore um, before the last two, and then it kind of looks like pounds and pence. Make sense? Yes, I, th I thought you were using it as a uh, replacement for the decimal point somehow, but do that. You could use decimals. Um, personally, uh, and sometimes I do, but I find uh, when you're working with money, sometimes it's easier just for it to be in integers that are in pence. But it's a matter of opinion. OK, any more questions? Sorry, you did say comments as well, so I'm not going to cheat. So, um, so you mentioned um, tests being a living document. I think that it's also an executable one. Absolutely, right? So you know yeah. it's right. And automation is a similar thing to that. Is that fair? Yeah, that's what I mean by living in that oh, right. um, in the, uh, documentation in the form of comments might not be right, but you can be a bit more confident that a test, because it's being run, is a fair reflection of what is actually happening in the system. So, yeah, I'd agree. Another one over here. 
Um, I was wondering if you could expand on some of these simplified model comparisons that you had in the example. Um, yeah. Because uh, I've found in my team that uh, equality comparisons between objects can be very fragile when the data model shifts unexpectedly. Yeah, so um, the way I've done it is um, the, the esse essentially the idea is, the idea is it's a value object. Um, so a value object is a sort of concept that if an object has all the same values, then it is the same. And Python data classes are value objects. So you define them, you define all their attributes, and then if all the attributes are the same, then you can instantiate another instance and it will equate to the same thing. But if just one of them is different, it won't equate. So it's a really quick way of seeing whether or not a load of things are the same. Um, you could almost do a whole talk on this technique, to be honest. But there are loads of nice things you can do with Python data classes. Like you, could, you can have lists within them. They can be nested. You can have sets of nested data classes. And you can sort of build up your, your whole model so that it is a sort of simplified reflection of the more complicated non-value objects of your database. Um, in terms of like the transformation step, I guess if your schema changes, then you'd only have to change the transformation step, maybe. Um, but I'm not, I'm not sure how it would fit into that. Um, but it might help a bit. D does that answer your question? Yeah. OK, let's take one down the back. Thanks, David. Um, I love the way that you wrote your tests because they are testing behavior. Um, what is your definition of unit tests? Because I found that some people, um, myself included, a few years ago, thought that a unit test should be just testing this simple function that's just one line yeah. extensively. Do you have a good definition for unit test? That's a great question. I think maybe we shouldn't use the word unit test because it's just got too many meanings. I mean, like. Increasingly, there are loads of different models for thinking about tests, like uh, fast test and slow test. The current way I'm thinking about tests is high gear and low gear. So if you think of like driving on a motorway as high gear and climbing up a hill as low gear, and like you have your low gear tests, which are all about giving you signal on specific bugs, specific like testing boundary conditions, and if possible, they should be fast. But sort of the important thing is that they're giving you lots of signal on a very specific bit of your system, while the high gear tests are, are all about moving quickly. So the, the high gear test should allow you to refactor extensively and be at, at a distance from the implementation of your code, while the low gear tests are all about helping you write specific implementations and understand whether or not they fully work. Does that make sense? It does make sense. I call them fast tests or slow tests. Yeah, although I think it would be okay if, if I, personally, I, obviously test speed is important, but I don't think it's the only thing. And I actually think I care more about whether or not it, the kind of signal it will give me on whether or not something's broken or, and how tolerant it will be of refactoring. But it's it's I, I don't know how to drive, that's why. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, let's give David one final big round of applause.